What do you get when you combine litigation, Kristen Chenoweth, Listerine breath strips, stock buybacks, and prescription strength painkiller? Hey everybody, Walrus here from Walrus Street, bringing you a DD today on Bio Delivery Sciences, ticker BDSI. Just a reminder, I am not a financial professional. All information in this video is for entertainment purposes only. BDSI is a company that I've been following personally since I covered a SellRx a couple of months ago. BDSI already has a product in the market, already has FDA approval, it's in sales, it's cash flow positive. They're rolling in the money so much right now that they're doing stock buybacks. It's not all green rosy for this company. There are some negatives we are going to cover them, but I think this is a very interesting opportunity for a small cap pharmaceutical company. Nobody suggested BDSI to me. Other than your ridiculous price claim videos on YouTube, there was really only one other YouTuber that covered it in decent depth. If you guys do wanna check out physician finances and investing, he did cover BDSI in a couple of videos within the last few weeks. The reason that I'm covering this today, they just reported their fourth quarter and year-end earnings, and it was absolutely killer. But the stock price has been declining. We're going to talk about why that is in this video. Let's get to it. So this is their website, Biodelivery Sciences, inspiring solutions for better health, advanced novel therapies designed to improve the lives of people living with serious and debilitating chronic conditions, specifically chronic pain. Their purpose to be a specialty pharmaceutical company working to deliver innovative therapies for individuals living with serious and debilitating chronic conditions. BDSI offers a diverse portfolio of solutions for the treatment of serious and debilitating chronic conditions, including unique therapeutic innovations like buccal film technology designed to help optimize drug delivery. I think their website is a little out of date because they're talking about a diverse portfolio here. And you would be thinking, oh, diverse portfolio, what is that, like six, 10 medications, something like that? No. It's two, they have two medications. So I don't wanna call this one a red flag, but this is a little bit misleading. BDSI strives to help address chronic pain, long-term pain. Chronic pain is something that a lot of people do deal with, and it could be stemming from anything from like lower back pain, fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, neuropathy, like nerve damage, that sort of thing, even shingles. All of those would be causes of chronic pain. Chronic pain is is pain that lasts a long time. In medicine, the distinction between acute and chronic pain is sometimes determined by the amount of time since the onset. Two commonly used markers are pain that continues at three months and six months since onset. Some theorists and researchers place the transition between acute and chronic pain at 12 months. Earlier, I did the video on a CellRx, ACRX. Their product, Desuvia, the sublingual sufensinol product, deals with acute pain. That's short-term pain. This is for long-term pain, totally different product. Chronic pain is a real problem and it affects people's quality of lives to a degree that those of us who don't suffer from chronic pain will never understand. Chronic pain contributes to decreased physical activity for fear of making the pain worse. Now, as far as management of chronic pain is concerned, there are non-opioid treatments, interventional pain management like trigger point injections, neurolytic blocks, radiotherapy. There are psychological treatments for chronic pain, including cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, acceptance and commitment, therapy. And exercise can sometimes be used like low impact exercise like Tai Chi, but the evidence of its benefits are tentative. We have alternative medicines like hypnosis, medical marijuana, transcranial magnetic stimulation, kinesio tape, myofascial release. The product from BDSI is a type of opioid. Now let's take a look at the total addressable market here. It is substantial. So this is a $150 billion plus chronic pain treatment market. It's pretty predicted to progress at a CAGR, an annual growth rate of 6.5% from 2020 to 2030, generating that $151 billion value by 2030. The factors fueling the expansion of the market are the soaring geriatric populations, the subsequent rise in the need for elderly care, and the growing incidence of chronic diseases around the world. One thing you'll notice about chronic pain is the patients who are typically suffering from chronic pain tend to be in older age brackets. And with an aging population in most
most countries in the world, this is something that is a growing market. The drug category is further divided into NSAIDs, opioids, antidepressants, anticonvulsants. Out of these, the opioids are predicted to register the highest growth in the chronic pain treatment market in the upcoming years. Globally, the chronic pain treatment market recorded the highest growth in North America during the past few years, and this trend will continue in the forthcoming years. This would be a result of the growing geriatric population, the existence of several chronic pain management medicines and devices, and the rising prevalence of chronic diseases in the region. We have a market that's growing by 6.5% per year, reaching a potential $150 billion by 2030. We've got a drug produced by BDSI that's sold in America. North America has the highest rate of chronic pain, and we have the drug class of opioids growing fastest among all of the treatment methods for this area. I'd say that establishes the TAM pretty well. There is a big market here. And here we could see North America is currently the largest market, but Asia Pacific region is the fastest growing market. Grandview Research, they actually have a higher CAGR, 9% from 2020 to 2027. Now, whether it's 6.5% or 9%, it really doesn't matter. The point is, this is definitively a growing market. This is definitively an area of unmet need where people need new types of treatment because the drug class that's most prescribed, opioids, are incredibly addictive. So we need something that's a little less addictive. That'd be great. This is one of the areas where BDSI shines. BDSI's flagship product, Belbuca, uses a very specific type of opioid called buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is an opioid used to treat opioid use disorder, acute pain, and chronic pain. It could be used under the tongue, sublingual, in the cheek, buccal, by injection, intravenous, or through a skin patch, transdermal. It was patented in 1965, approved for medical use in 1981. It is a Schedule III controlled substance. One of the big selling points for buprenorphine is that it's actually less addictive than other opioids. But just because something is less addictive doesn't mean it's not addictive. Buprenorphine does still have with it some dependency issues. Buprenorphine treatment carries the risk of causing psychological or physical dependence. It has a slow onset and a long half-life of 24 to 60 hours. Once a person is stabilized on the medication, three options remain. Continual use, switching to buprenorphine naloxone mixes, or medically supervised withdrawal. This I found to be very, very interesting, especially after having covered ACRX. Achieving acute opioid analgesia is difficult in persons using buprenorphine for opioid replacement therapy. Sufentanil, a powerful fentanyl analog, is the only drug powerful enough to relieve pain in emergency settings because it is the only opioid that has the potency and binding affinity strong enough to displace buprenorphine from the opioid receptors in the CNS to provide analgesia. The reason that I'm even saying this, sufentanil, if you remember, is the primary ingredient of Desuvia from Acelerex. If a patient, a chronic pain patient is on buprenorphine, if they're taking Belbuca from BDSI, they end up having the buprenorphine filling up their system. It kind of sits in the pain receptors. Other opioids can't displace it from the pain receptor, but sufentanil is strong enough to come up and knock it out and replace it. Why would you need this? If there's an acute pain situation like a broken bone or a GSW or something like that, where the patient needs stronger pain relief right away, then Sufentanil is the only option here if the patient's already on buprenorphine. So you can see that Acelerex actually perfectly complements BDSI with the Desuvia product and the Belbuca product. There are a couple of different types of buprenorphine already available. There's a sublingual tablet called Subutex, transmucosal film called Suboxone, transdermal patch called Butrans, and a parental formulation, Buprenex. Buprenex is an IV drug. Subutex is a sublingual lingual tablet, but the manufacturer actually recommends against using Subutex for pain due to reports of death in opioid-naive patients. Ooh, yeah, okay, we're not going to give them that. Suboxone is a transmucosal film, and it combines the formulation of buprenorphine and naloxone. I'm oversimplifying this, but just a refresher, naloxone is kind of like the antidote for an opioid overdose. Belbuca and Butrans are really the two that kind of compete with each other. Belbuca is the product from BDSI, 
guy and it's a strip like a Listerine breath strip and you put it on your cheek and it dissolves. Butrans makes a transdermal skin patch. The medication is absorbed through the skin. I wanted to bring in a third party study to talk about the effectiveness here of buprenorphine. This is from the University of Washington. Buprenorphine does appear to provide adequate analgesia for many patients who are switching from full opioid agonists. That would be stronger opioids. Buprenorphine is clearly safer than high dose full agonists. That wraps up the market. You could see there's a huge market for it. You could see buprenorphine is one player in the opioid area, but it's actually safer for patients to use buprenorphine than other opioids. Now, let's get into my four questions before I invest in a company. Who's in charge? What's the product? What are the financials? Who else is involved? Starting with who's in charge. Last November, they just appointed a new CEO, Jeff Bailey. Previous to this appointment, he was the interim CEO, but he was made full CEO in November. Mr. Bailey has an accomplished record leading both public and private healthcare companies where he has leveraged his diverse leadership experiences in various functional areas, including commercial, supply chain, and business development, as well as in licensing and transactions, 20-year career at Johnson & Johnson, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, tenure as operating unit president at Novartis, CCO at King Pharmaceuticals, COO at Fujira Pharmaceuticals, chairman and CEO at Neurovance, president and CEO of Lanthius Medical Imaging, taking that company public, and CEO of Illuminos Medical, which was acquired in May 2020. So the CEO is super experienced, a lot of different companies under his belt, a lot of different roles outside of just CEO. This is his LinkedIn here. He's also currently the chairman of the board of directors at Aileron Therapeutics, and he's an advisor for venture investors for Madison Vaccines. This is their management team here. I do want to take a look at Scott Lesha, the president and CCO. The reason that I say that is because the company is expanding its marketing aggressively to increase its sales, and he's the one that's mostly dealing with this. Before joining BDSI, Scott was a senior executive with Salix Pharmaceuticals, holding several leadership positions, including head of gastroenterology, sales force, and training. Scott played a critical role in building Salix's commercial team into a leading gastroenterology sales force. The reason this is actually important is because BDSI's second product is a gastroenterology product. He also assumed roles leading responsibility in specialty pharma companies, including Solvay Pharmaceuticals, Aklassen Pharmaceuticals, more than 20 years of experience leading commercial organizations, and over 30 years of biopharma experience. So the CEO, President, CCO, both guys have a lot of experience in this area, which is good, especially since we're in the commercialization phase of the product. This is a little uncommon, but when we're talking about the people affiliated with BDSI, I think it's important to mention Kristen Chenoweth. Kristen Chenoweth is an actress, a singer, a stage actress, and she is the spokesperson since the end of 2019 for BDSI. Kristen Chenoweth famously is a chronic pain sufferer. So this was a really brilliant marketing strategy by the company bringing on Kristen Chenoweth as their spokesperson, and she's running their this is pain campaign. This is pain.com. People that live with chronic pain often feel like they're alone and that other people don't understand what they're going through because chronic pain isn't something that an outsider can see and it's only something that the person dealing with it can feel. So you have this very kind of aesthetic website showing people that are isolated, people that are alone. You could go to their real stories. They interviewed some people. Here's Kristen Chenoweth here. They ended up hiring a body painting artist named Trina. Mary, based on the symptoms that each of the people felt, the body painting artist was able to paint their bodies. This gentleman, Al, here described his chronic pain as being like lava all around his body. So you could see the body painting here. I know this isn't really super important for an investment, but from a marketing standpoint, doing stuff like this is really cool. And if you look at the people on the website that are featured here, they're all older, which is the target age group for chronic pain management. Question two, what's the product? They have two products, Bell Yucca, which uses bioerodible mucoadhesive technology, BEMA technology. One of the side effects of Belbuca is gastrointestinal obstruction, also known as constipation. The other product they sell is Symproic. Symproic is an opioid antagonist indicated for the treatment of opioid-induced constipation, OIC, in adult patients with chronic non-cancer pain. So BDSI has two products, Belbuca, which has a side effect of constipation, and Symproic, which treats that constipation. This is some ingenious product design right here. We're gonna sell you the problem, and then we're gonna sell you the cure. I mean, 
mean, I joke about it, but really this is just good business strategy. This is the Bellbuca website. Just a couple of points about it. It's been proven to reduce pain in those previously taken commonly prescribed opioids and in those who have not previously taken opioids. Side effects are comparable to placebo. Most common ones are nausea, constipation, headache, vomiting, dizziness, and sleepiness. But what sets Bellbuca apart, even from Butrans, is the number of dosing options. Bellbuca offers seven different dosing options. Bellbuca is a long-acting opioid. Sometimes you see in the literature the abbreviation LAO, that's long-acting opioid, as opposed to short-acting opioid. It uses a unique delivery system. It delivers the medicine, buprenorphine, efficiently through the inside of your cheek, getting into your bloodstream more directly. This is the delivery system that's used to deliver the buprenorphine. You could see Bellbuca just adheres to the inside of the cheek. The mucoadhesive layer bonds with the mucous membrane, and the medication diffuses into the cheek's blood vessels, offering a one-way flow of medication, so you're not going to be swallowing it. It's then carried throughout the body by the circulatory system. Dissolves quickly, you can talk normally, and move on with your daily life. BDSI does hold the patents for the BEMA technology. This is their investor presentation from their website. One in five U.S. adults suffers from chronic pain. 19.6 million adults report high-impact chronic pain. This would be chronic pain that impacts their daily lives. LAOs, long-acting opioids, remains a large prescription market, and there were 10.8 million prescriptions written for long-acting opioids in 2020. $2.9 billion for the total annual LAO sales in 2020. So earlier, we looked at the total addressable market of all chronic pain management. This number, though, might be a little more reasonable for the SAM, the serviceable addressable market. This would be the LAO market of $2.9 billion. So they've had significant double-digit year-on-year growth in Belbuca total prescriptions, TRX is total prescription. So their volume has increased 20,000 over the last year. So it's up 20%. And not only is it growing, it's growing in market share. We went from 3.3% of the market share in Q4 2019 to 4.5% of the market share in Q4 2020. So this is actually a compounding growth because you're getting the multiplier where the market itself is growing at a CAGR of 6.5 to 9%. And you're also getting Belbuca expanding within that market, going from a 3.3% market share to a 4.5%. So even though you might think, oh, it's only a 1.2% increase in market share, yeah, but also the market itself is growing by another 6.5 to 9% per year. It's building its prescriber base, adding over a thousand new prescribers for each of the last six quarters. It's growing across all insurance types. Regarding Symproic, up to 84% of patients with OIC report negative impact on their quality of life. Symproic, which is taken once daily, any time of the day, carries the highest recommendation from the American Gastroenterological Association, is the ideal complementary asset to Belbuca, and is promoted to overlapping HCP targets. Symproic is also growing in its total prescriptions and its percent market share. Both medications had total prescription growth that outperformed expectations in quarter four and in 2020 overall, and they have robust annual net revenue growth trends. 2019-2020, we're up in revenue by a 40% increase. One red flag though, most of their revenue is in Belbuca with only a small percent in Symproic and then an even smaller percent in other. Regarding the other, they have some other medications that they were developing that they kind of sold the rights to, to other companies, and they collect royalties on the rights for those medications. But the royalties, I looked into it and it's less than 1% of their total revenue. So it's not really worth talking about too much in this video. Now, I think it's worth looking at this just because I am pragmatic. And this is on WebMD, user reviews and ratings of Belbuca. It's receiving about 2.5 out of five stars here for chronic pain treatment, but this is only out of 39 reviews, which is a really small N. Their big competitor, Butrans, which is the transdermal patch, has a higher rating of about 3.4 to four stars, but that's only out of 89 reviews. I'm only bringing that up just to be realistic. It is a very small N, 39, 89 reviews, but it seems that Butrans is slightly better received. Remember, Belbuca offers more customization in the dosages. So there's a positive, negative. Also, Belbuca gets absorbed into the bloodstream faster. On the first dose of Butrans, you have to wait about three days before feeling the effects. Belbuca, the effects happen almost immediately. Now, Butrans is marketed by Purdue Pharma. There are different doses available, but the Belbuca has 
more doses, has a wider range. Something that might actually hurt Butran sales, just last April, Amnil launches generic Butrans following ANDA approval by the FDA. So Amnil Pharmaceuticals had their own competitive generic therapy designation given to their buprenorphine transdermal system. So Butrans sales are gonna be decreasing and there's a generic, which is a cheaper option available for the last year, but that didn't actually cut into the Belbuca market. As you saw, the Belbuca market share is still expanding, the revenue is still growing. So the only thing this generic for Butrans did was hurt the Butrans sales themselves. Biodelivery Science has announced a significant additional insurance coverage for both Belbuca and Simproic. The addition of this large national pharmacy benefit manager brings the total number of commercial lives with preferred access to Belbuca to more than 104 million out of more than 160 million with coverage and more than 76 million overall covered lives for Simproic. Right now, even though it's not technically covered on Medicare, there is insurance coverage for about 30% of the adults in America. Question number three, what are their financials? So this is their share price here, 385 a share for BDSI. You can see they had a little bit of a spike at the end of the day on Friday. That was off some news. Earnings, they're pretty consistently beating their expectations. The only miss was on quarter two, which as you remember was the COVID drop for everybody. So their sales kind of fell off, but they're consistently beating their earnings projections by analysts. We're actually in a little bit of a downtrend here, down to 385. Some stuff that's really attractive Active here for the metrics of the company, their PE right now is only 15.91, which is much lower than most pharma companies. Their forward PE is 6.55, which makes sense, obviously. Forward PE is typically lower than PE. Insider ownership is pretty low, 0.4%, and insiders have been selling out of the company, which is a bit of a red flag. But offsetting that is the fact that institutional ownership is at 75% of the company. That is obscenely high. They have 100 101 million shares outstanding, 98.5 float, only 3% shorted. And keep in mind that they are doing a buyback for $25 million. So that shares outstanding is gonna be declining over time. About their growth, this is Deloitte and this is their 2020 technology fast 500 rankings. These are the fastest growing tech and life science companies in North America. 198, this is bio delivery sciences, BDSI. 617% growth over the period. That's from 2016 to 2020. The 2020 Technology Fast 500 award winners are selected based on their percentage fiscal year revenue growth during the period from 2016 to 2020. This is their news release for their full year 2020 and quarter four results. Total company full year net revenue of 156.5 million, delivered growth of 40% versus 2019, mainly driven by Belbuca. Sales net of 136, an increase of 40% compared to 2019. And some Proic net sales of 14.7 million, an increase of 83% over 2019. So the company's revenue is growing. Most of it's driven by Belbuca, but Simproic is also growing significantly. Now this is in November. Biodelivery Science announces a $25 million share repurchase program. This share repurchase program reflects our confidence in the long-term outlook of the company, including our ability to generate strong cash flow, said the CEO. Importantly, we remain focused on balancing our disciplined approach to capital allocation against growth opportunities available to BDSI, including continuing to invest in organic growth of our portfolio, along with pursuing strategic acquisitions that will continue to drive long-term shareholder value. The company has only bought back to this point 11% of its possible capital allocation to the share buyback, which means they still have 89% of that 25 million to spend on their share buyback. Here, the CEO mentions that they're looking for shareholder value, company growth, and possible acquisitions down the road. I don't usually look at simply Wall Street, but here I want to show you guys because this is honestly one of the healthiest snowflakes on Simply Wall Street that I've seen for a small cap company. High value, high future, high past, high health. The only thing they don't have is a dividend because they don't pay a dividend. They're trading at an 81% discount to their fair value. Now Simply Wall Street has their own math as to how they end up coming up with these, but that's a significant discount, 81%. So their current price is 385. The fair value they're saying is $20.21. Their forecasted annual earnings growth is 31%. This is based on their own projections for 2021. And you can see the chart here of their revenue and their earnings both increasing. The company is beating industry and the market in growth for revenue and earnings both. And they're financially healthy. Short-term, much more assets than liabilities. Long-term,
long-term, fewer assets than liabilities, but with a revenue increase, this isn't very concerning at all. Their debt to equity history in the last year since they've become profitable, they've not taken on the high amount of debt and they're actually increasing their equity to cover their debt positions. Even on the balance sheet, the debt's not very serious. That brings us to question number four, who's involved? We talked about this briefly already. Insiders have been selling shares, not buying. But 1.8% here owned by insiders, 14.5% hedge funds, 57% institutions, general public holds 26%. For those institutions, most of this is green. With some of these increases in position changes, like for UBS Asset Management, increasing their position 840%, Wasatch Advisors increasing 122%, Deerfield upping at 24%. We've got Deerfield at 9.5 million shares, BlackRock at 8.2, Vanguard at 4.8. These are big name institutions and funds holding a huge amount of shares in this company, and the majority of them are increasing their stake over time. This is the Yahoo page. We see yet another different percent for insiders. I don't know how they all get different percents here, but this is 2.45. Institutions is 75.6% of the float, 73.7% of the shares. Same institutions here. The last thing, we can't talk about BDSI without talking about the litigations. This company's immediate future is going to be defined by the outcome of some litigations. The reason that this company has been kind of range bound for its share price since 2018 is because it is in limbo over a litigation that is coming to an end very soon. BDSI filed a complaint for patent infringement against Alvagen. They're asserting that Alvagen infringes on BDSI's orange book listed patents for Belbuca. Alvagen is looking to make a generic form of Belbuca. BDSI is saying that Alvagen is infringing on the patents that they hold on their technology for at least the next six years. This is from their last earnings call. One of the analysts directly asked them the question. I know you guys can't comment specifically on the litigation, but correct me if I'm wrong, that a win or a loss here could be quite transformational for the company. Am I overplaying that thought? The CEO answers this question and says, it's a good question. It's an important outcome for us. That's clear. We will continue to take a prudent approach to our business development activity. There's a link between the outcome of the trial and our BD efforts, BD's business development. However, we remain very focused in parallel with our BD efforts, bringing shareholder value in the meantime. What we do know is they met in the courts in March. Each Alvagen and BDSI have two months to send details for the cases to the court, at which point it'll be reviewed and an outcome will be determined shortly thereafter. So if that started in March, by May, we should know something about this litigation. Before you're saying, oh, it's a coin flip, they win or they lose, BDSI has already settled patent litigation with Tiva. Tiva is one of the largest generics producers in the world. It's based out of Israel. BDSI already came to a favorable settlement with Tiva, granting BDSI patent protection until 2027. Also, just Friday, if you're looking at the price spike on the chart and wondering why it spiked, there was another patent infringement litigation from another generics company. This one was called Aquestive Therapeutics. BDSI is bringing an inequitable conduct counterclaim against them. This ruling ended up going in favor of BDSI and the court denied Aquestive's motion to strike. So this patent situation is really not uncommon for BDSI. They've been battling this since 2017 with Tiva. So understanding that they've already had courts rule in their favor with Tiva and Aquestive, there is positivity going into this Alvagen situation that courts will rule in their favor again. I understand each case is its own animal, but there is a history here of BDSI aggressively defending their own patents legally. Where does that leave me? I want to run a little SWOT analysis here. Let's look at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for the company because they are very real. For the strengths, we have the chemical properties of buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is less addictive than other opioids, and it can be used long-term with a lower saturation ceiling. We have incredibly strong financials. The company's financials are so strong that they're doing stock buybacks. And we have 75% institutional ownership. And most of those institutions, including the big names like Vanguard and BlackRock, are increasing their stake in the company. Weaknesses. There's no pipeline. There's no R&D. The company has stated several times that's not their goal. They just want to market their existing products. There's really no fallback plan. The bulk of their revenue comes from one product, Belbuca. They have two products and they collect royalties from elsewhere, but the vast majority of the revenue comes from just one product. This is another weakness. We know that in 2027, there is a generic coming to market from Tiva. Regardless of the outcome with Alvagen and Aquestive, Tiva is putting a generic 
on the market in 2027. There's insider selling. We don't know what causes people to sell shares, but typically insider selling is thought of as a weakness. Opportunities. Both Belbuca and Simproic are increasing their market share. On top of that market share increase, the CAGR of the chronic pain market is increasing at about 6.5 to 9% per year. The opioid prescriptions themselves are also increasing within that increasing market. So you guys get the idea. There's a whole lot of increasing here. Another opportunity is going to be a possible M&A. The company's cash flow positive. They have cash on hand. They're not rushing to repurchase all their shares, which means they have money on the sidelines for a possible acquisition. The CEO mentioned in the call that they would be looking to add another CNS type company that fits with the mold of the products they're trying to sell for an acquisition. They don't want to acquire another R&D clinical phase company. They want to acquire a company with revenue ready products. A seller X, maybe. Mm -hmm. And another opportunity is the litigation success. If they have a positive ruling on the litigation with Alvagen, seeing as this has been range binding their shares for the last two years, this is going to probably cause the share price to spike. So we're looking at a very strong catalyst, assuming the court case goes in their favor in two months. Threats. I can't say it any other way. If the litigation with Alvagen does not go in their favor in two months, the company's share price is going to take a huge hit. Even though Alvagen is then probably going to be facing a litigation battle with Tiva, who has the rights for the generic in 2027, we don't know exactly how long that's going to go. That's all hypothetical. Alvagen probably couldn't get to market for about a year after the litigation with their generic. My point is, this is a threat, but it doesn't mean that BDSI will be dead in the water at that point. Another threat always is opioid legal restrictions. I don't think this is a huge threat though, because buprenorphine is not as addictive as other opioids, but it is still a phase three substance and we have to be realistic. This is a threat. What's my plan? I am going to go in for about 500 shares on this one, and I'm looking to buy at a price of about $3.75 or lower. We have some pretty strong support around there, so I don't expect it to drop much further than that. Also, I'm looking at doing a couple of calls around the three month range to the end of May, hoping to catch a litigation spike on the calls. The calls are going to be kind of conservative at the money calls. I'm going to look at the pricing, try to find something that's attractive and take advantage of that litigation news. If we take a look in Webull, we can see that the average median buying price is higher than the entry point right now. And also we can see that most of the analysts are pricing this in the range of $5.50 to $8, but that's still with the litigation gray area. If the litigation gets lifted and rules in favor of BDSI, those analyst projections go out the window and we're going to be seeing a totally new set of numbers here. This has potential explosive growth on the catalyst of that litigation. And also we have possible catalysts of an acquisition at some point this year. All right, guys, thanks for following along. If you're new to investing, please check out my Webull referral link below. If you sign up using my referral link, deposit $100 into your account, you get some free stock, I get some free stock, everybody wins because I'm partnered with Webull. The stock that I'm getting is valued at $30 or higher. Also, if you enjoyed the content, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. And if you want to be alerted to all my content as soon as it goes live, make sure you hit that notification bell. All right, everybody, thanks a lot. Have a good week.